in this week's national interest, we raise some tough questions. Now, India of the BJP and RSS so covets right to sermonize the entire world. But does our present conform to our glorious past, our brilliant past? Can we aspire for that moral stature if we respond to any criticism with prickly what about re? So here is what we are talking about. External Affairs Minister S. Cheshankar has vowed people back home with a sharp response to criticism over two issues in Washington. One, India's enhanced purchase of oil from Russia and second, the human rights situation in India. To the first, he responded substantively, quite correctly and firmly, reminding the questioner at his joint press conference after the 2 plus 2 meeting that Europe imported more from Russia, more oil from Russia in one afternoon what India did in an entire month. So look who's talking. That was a brilliant response. To the second, his somewhat belated counter was pure rhetoric and it's no surprise that that has cheered the fans at home even more because rhetoric is more fun. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken made a somewhat gratuitous reference to the U.S. concern over the human rights situation in India. Decades of diplomatic training restrained Jay Shankar from responding instantly as an event meant to showcase strategic solidarity and warmth would have yielded the wrongest possible headline. But he responded at an event subsequently saying the human rights issue wasn't discussed at the talks one. And second, to get even, he added that India too sometimes had concerns about the human rights situation in the US. This was particularly so when it affected people of the Indian origin. Predictably, this evoked that heady, Dekha America ko suna diya. See how he told of the Americans' response back home. Finally, India has a minister with this incredible confidence who can tell of the Americans to their faces. You know, we all like to be anti-American deep inside. Most of us are. All of that is fine. But is that the point? Is international diplomacy at the highest level to be seen as a television debate for scoring points, even if it's a civilized debate? It is also true that whenever people of Indian origin are targeted in the US or elsewhere, like the six in the recent past in the US, India has spoken up. But this line of attack as India's defense and the breathless excitement it has generated misses the central point. What is that? First of all, this was a conversation between friends. And friendship in international relations involves some criticism of each other. Unless, of course, you are Pakistan, Russia or the entire OIC to China. Then you'd criticize nothing about China. You just say fantastic, brilliant, you are the best and so on. Now, India and the US as two democracies have argued for decades. In early 50s, Nehru lectured Eisenhower on China, Korea and communism. In fact, documents subsequently declassified by the US State Department have very interesting exchanges there. Even later, when Rajiv Gandhi met Reagan, Ronald Reagan, on his early honeymoon phase visits to Washington, the post-summit briefings included a delightful sidelight. Rajiv, it was said, picked up a couple of roasted almonds from the table and appreciated their taste. He said, they are wonderful. These are from my state, California, Ronald Reagan said. When do you think we'll be able to sell these in your country. That argument, by the way, is still not fully settled. You know what happened when Trump was there. He put duties on some things. India put duties on some things. Uh, so the almond argument is this still not fully settled. The fact is, from human rights to trade, sanctions to Afghanistan, India and the US have disagreed and argued. Even in this one, the epoch of their strategic partnership, which began evolving, post Kargil. Until about a decade back, we have, the two countries have fought over the continued US arming of Pakistan. Notably, when the consignment of AMRAAM air-to-air missiles for PAF F-16s was delivered in 2010. One of them shot down Wing Commander Abhinandan's MiG-21 Bison about three years ago. Or more recently, we have fought over India's purchase of the Russian S-400. But friends also know how to deal with differences. The human rights issue has been a thorn in India's relations with the West for a little over three decades now. Say since 1991, 
when insurgency first broke out in Kashmir. P.V. Narsemarao's government dealt with it, the insurgency with an iron hand, as it did at the same time with terror in Punjab. There were no quarters given. Western human rights organizations ran a massive campaign. In the early glow of the victory in Cold War, it also hit home with their governments. India's global political capital also was then not a fraction of what it is now. Rao therefore responded firmly but tactfully, as one as someone like him would. He answered the criticism aggressively. We are a democracy. We have a free media and activists. Then he defeated the Pak-sponsored and West-backed resolution on human rights against India at Geneva. But he also lifted the ban imposed earlier by Governor Jagmohan on the foreign press traveling to Kashmir and set up the National Human Rights Commission, NHRC, under Justice Ranganath Mishra. Why do we need human rights organizations from, from overseas coming here when we have our own? That was his argument. The picture now is very different in this world. The balance of power is different. India's place is different. But if the Americans, friends rather than hostile as they were in the early 90s, particularly during Clinton's first presidency, if they are needling India over human rights, they aren't talking about Kashmir or Punjab. That's a big difference. Those two issues, those two issues are seen as settled, including the change in the constitutional status of Kashmir. None of these powers, particularly the US, is complaining about it. They are talking instead about the treatment of India's minorities, especially the Muslims, though Christians also feature in the US thought process. Besides minorities, there are activists, Modi government critics, NGOs and so on. In his response, Jay Shankar also alluded to India's understanding of vote bank compulsions or Biden administration's vote bank compulsions. The last Muslim minority by and large votes for the Democrats in the US. Also, the quote-unquote progressive group within the party is strongly committed to Muslim voters and interests. We could therefore translate Jay Shankar's response as, we know where you are coming from, we know about your vote banks, but surely you do not want the squad to undermine the quad. No, squad is the name for those, that group of progressives in the Democratic Party. But is our larger national interest, the stature of our nation, the respect in which it is held globally, its moral authority, all going to be determined by debating points. Now you might point out to me a contradiction in my own views because just three weeks back, I had argued that self-interest, not morality, determined serious nation's strategic policies, cynical self-interest. Here is how I would argue that it isn't contradictory. Because it is the BJP, its Prime Minister and the government, an ideological guru, the RSS, which see India rising as the Vishwa Guru, the teacher to the world, as Buddha and Lord Krishna might have been in ancient times, and Swami Vivekananda and Sri Aurobindo more recently. It is we who so covet sermonizing rights to the world. Our pages learn from us how the most diverse large population in the world lives in harmony in a robust democracy. We Indians claim lecturing rights on democracy. See, we are the oldest democracy. If you have doubts, Google Vaishali, you silly Westerners. 300, 400 years before Christ, we had democracy. Diversity, did we slaughter our tribals like you, like you did with Native Americans, huh? And equality, when did we have slavery and that too? Based on race, look at yourselves, Americans. At which point, we need to ask an inconvenient question. Does our present conform to that brilliant tradition? Can we aspire for that moral stature if we respond to all criticism with this prickly what about re? Of course, the partisan would cheer, but that doesn't mean we lose the ability to look within or stop listening to friends. Many of the stories, the pictures going out of India worldwide lately with these provocative Ram Navmi processions, taunting of Muslims, bulldozers targeting mostly their properties, the sweeping othering of a community of 20 crore are painting the front pages and TV screens in the democratic world. That is where most of the friends we covet lie. Soon enough, as happened following the CAA NRC campaign, and the violence, these will also make our vital friends 
among the Muslim nations from Bangladesh to Saudi Arabia and UAE and EZ. The best time for course correction, therefore, is now. This week's national interest also reminds me of one story and I am adding that as a postscript to the column. Now you know you can always trust Indian diplomats to outsmart anybody in an argument, especially in English language. In 1985, Manishankar then a foreign service officer, he was in a delegation in Washington negotiating an agreement on dual use technology transfers. The Americans changed a particular word in the agreement. When the Indian side objected, an American official said in part just that his colleague who had made the change had been to Harvard University, so he must be right. Manishankar Iyer was not going to lose that argument so easily. He said, you see, he went to Cambridge Mass. Mass, he played on Mass, which is the short form for Massachusetts. So he said, you went to an ordinary Cambridge, that's an Aam Madhmiya Cambridge. I went to Cambridge of the elite, the original Cambridge. So what I say on English language must be right. The Americans conceded the point with a little laugh.